As we've been working our way through John's gospel, we've been in uh, the private ministry of Jesus to his apostles, the first uh, 12 chapters were his public ministry to Israel. His public ministry to Israel has ended because of their national rejection of him. And uh, hi, Camille, I'm glad to see you here. You're feeling good? Good. Praise the Lord. Good. Uh, the national rejection of Jesus caused him to retreat now and begin his private ministry to his own. That's chapters 13 through 17. 13 and 14 are the first part of that private ministry. It's the Seder meal or the Passover that Jesus celebrates with his own. Very intimate, very uh, meaningful, very inspiring, very moving. But then as we move into chapters 15, 16, and 17, he's left the upper room where they were holding the Passover and he's making his way to the Garden of Gethsemane across the Kidron. But he's sharing some very important things with his own. Now remember in chapter 13 it began with what? That's right, a foot washing. Who said that? (laughs) Nobody. (laughs) It began with a foot washing. So basically he was cleansing them to prepare them for that celebration of Passover to really honor and worship Hashem, the Lord, right? But something else had to be cleansed. The room had to be cleansed. And what happened in chapter 13 where he, in fact, cleansed the room? Judas had to leave, right? He announced who the betrayer would be. And then he told Judas, what you do, must do, and do it quickly. Go. And as soon as Judas, uh, Satan entered him, and Judas went out, and it was night. 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 Very good. And night is first used in Genesis, where the darkness he called night. And what does night mean in the Hebrew? A twisting away from the light. That's what night means. Pretty frightening, isn't it? And as soon as he went out, it was night. But then the most intimate relationship that Jesus would ever have with his disciples began there after that. He began to tell them that he is one with the Father. Philip says, show us the Father. And he said, have you been so long with me and you haven't seen the Father? He began to speak to them about the Holy Spirit, the Comforter who would come. And what's that name in the Greek? Parakaletos. And what does it mean? To come alongside, para, alongside, kaletos, to call, right? You're the uh, kaletos hagios... uh, Agabetos Kaletos Hagios that Romans talks about. What is that? The beloved called saints. Hmm? And we are also the ecclesia. What's that mean? The ecclesia is the called out. And, it is, and we translate the word ecclesia into the English word church. Church. So the church is called out, but the Parakaletos is called to come alongside. And that's what we're going to see in a moment. We're called out. But as we move through the chapters, we see in chapter 15, he begins, well, in chapter 14, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The way is? The way is? Love. Agapeo, love. The way is love. The truth is? His word, the life. There's no life except found in Christ. He offers us everlasting life, eternal life. And that's why I had the privilege to share that in great length while I was gone with my dear friend and his family, especially because he's facing the end of life here, but the beginning of new life there, right? But Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And then in verse 16 of chapter 14, we have the first mention of the Holy Spirit, or the helper, the parakaletos, who would come, right? And then the work of the Holy Spirit, where he would be with you, in you, and upon you. Hmm? We talked about that at some length. As we moved into chapter 14, later on in the chapter, he talks about a peace, a peace that transcends every circumstance and every situation, doesn't it? That peace with God, where you surrender, the peace of God, where the Holy Spirit comes to dwell within you. The Holy Spirit will only come and dwell with those who surrender their heart and life to him. And not only do you have peace with God, the peace of God, but you have the peace. When you really mature as a Christian, you realize Christianity is more about what we give than what we receive. Western Christianity, it's all about what you give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. Right? Keep me healthy. Give me a prosperous life. Give me a better marriage. Find me a mate, etc., etc. And the list goes on and on and on and on. It's all about gimme, 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 gimme. That's not where peace is found. That's not where joy is found. For it is more blessed to than to. Is that true? Have you discovered that in your own life? It truly is. Absolutely true. And, and so real Christianity is all about giving, not getting, right? Yeah, and so he was talking about that as well, and that the peace that you would have, peace of God, peace 
with God, peace in God. Then as we moved into chapter 15, as he's walking through the garden, and remember when he left the upper room and he's going to go down into the valley, the Kidron, across the Kidron, there's a, there was a vineyard there at that time. And so he's going through the vineyard and he's using the uh, motif for the analogy of what? The vine and the branches. He is divine and you ain't, right? <laughs> he's the vine and you are the branches. And when you think about God's love described for us in Corinthians, in uh, Galatians, excuse me, chapter five, it's, and this is the love of God singular, but then it's described, right? Love, joy, peace, Patience, goodness, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Those are the things that describe that love singularly. Now, as he's going through that vineyard, you see these grapes. Grapes are held on what? What do we call that, that bunch of grapes? We call it a cluster, a cluster, a cluster of grapes. The vine and the branches, and off the branches are clusters of grapes. And so as you look at that cluster, that's God's love, and each of those grapes could be with the, is describing the adjectives of that love. Love, joy, peace speaks of our relationship to the God. Please understand the first three are indicative or manifestations of your relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Love, joy, peace can only re resonate within you because God gives it, right? It's his love. We have a capacity now, as John Michael was talking about the fact that, you know, I'm, I'm so thankful for this loving little chapel family that we have here. And we do love one another. We rejoice with those who rejoice. We, we grieve with those who grieve or sorrow. Juan lost his brother this week, and so we're, we're grieving with Juan over the loss of his brother. But at the same time, we rejoice over the things that we rejoice over, aren't, don't we? Yeah. Mm. So that love, that joy, that joy that only comes as we are in obedience to his will, and there's a, light, a wellspring of joy you know what it's like when you're disobedient. You're miserable, aren't you? Yeah. Oh, but when you're obedient to God and you have the affirmation of the Holy Spirit, say, good job, good job. You're filled with joy, not happiness. Happiness happens to do with our outward circumstance. Joy happens to do with inward relationships. And then peace. Yeah, love, joy, peace. Speaking of our relationship to God. And then the next three? Patience, otherwise known as? Long suffering. No, nobody lets us suffer long, do you? Yeah, I'll pray for my, my friend Paul in New York. He's gone home to uh, under hospice care, the care of comfort until he passes. But I pray his passing is quickly so he won't have to suffer long here. But the great physician knows, doesn't he? Yeah. But nonetheless, it's long suffering. We suffer long with one another. Why? Because God has suffered long with us, hasn't he? And yeah, he suffered far longer with each of us individually than we ever have to suffer with one another. Isn't that true? Yeah. And what's next? Goodness. Kindness, goodness, kindness, goodness. Long suffering or patience, goodness, and kindness deals with our relationship, not with God, now our relationship with each other. Each other. Love one another. For love is of God, and if you truly love God and know God, then you'll love one another. We'll love the brethren. We know we have passed from death to life if we love the brother love one another as we should so the first three speak of my relationship to god the next three speak of my relationship to others the last three what were they gentleness, faithfulness gentleness and self-control oh, don't you like that self-control boy i should do and it's really christ control where christ is controlling my life that grace that grace to find the power to do what is you saying to obey huh to do what's right. He gives us his grace, the charismata, the gift of grace to strengthen us to do what is right. All he wants to know is, are you willing? Do you desire that? So those last three speak of our relationship to ourselves. J-O-Y. Jesus, others, and you last. And if you live that way, you're going to find joy. But people who live selfishly for what they can get rather than what they can give, you know, they're miserable most of the time. Isn't that true? Yeah. So he was talking about the peace in chapter 15. He's talking about the fruitfulness that would come. And then as we moved further into the chapter, 
in verses 9 through 17, he's talking about love perfected. Allowing, now listen, as I've told you before, you have the capacity to love supernaturally. We can choose to love in a fleshly way, in a carnal way. We can choose to love according to our own desires or bias or prejudices, but that's not what God has for us, is it? No. No. God wants us to choose to love according to his love, his agape love, his sacrificial, unconditional love. And if you are a Christian and the Holy Spirit dwells within you, you have that capacity. You have to decide to turn it on. How do you turn it on? In prayer, submitting to God. Lord, help me to love this person that I don't find lovable right now. You know, we love everybody, don't we? There's just some people we like more, right? <laughs> because we have a bias. But you can live beyond that bias. You can fulfill the commandment he's given as he finishes that little section in chapter 15, verses 9 through 17. In verse 17, he says, these things I command you that you love one another. Is that a new commandment? No, we've heard it from the beginning. You are a congregation that loves not only one another, but you love those who are in need. This congregation over the years has given sacrificially to the persecuted church. Every year at the end of the year, during October to December, we ask that you would give sacrificially to some need or some cause that exists out there. And this year it was for what? Alpha Ministry and Samaritan's Purse for the victims of the tornado in Kentucky and for Alpha Ministries for the work that would go on there in the Far East. Well, we contributed in the last three months of the year, $111,403. $111,435 at the end of the year. You did that. Look around. Look around. Now you know who you are who did that. You gave sacrificially and unconditionally. For the year, for the year ending 2021, you gave $129,000 to missions, outward to missions. We only received $288,000 all year. What percentage do you give outward there for the work of the kingdom? What percentage is that of our total budget? How much? It's 45%. That is unheard of. We received $288,000 for the year. We gave out $129,000. It's a missions. If you do the math, you gave 45% of what you have gathered together as an ecclesia, as a church, outward to missions. Applaud yourself, will you? Praise God. Yeah, praise God for what he has done. That's an, that's an amazing number. That is unheard of. You can't find another church in Greenville, I dare you challenge you, that gives 45% of their budget out. So why? Why? Because the church has learned to be inwardly focused. What I can get, 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 gimme, 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 gimme. Is that true? Yeah. Praise God. You do. You have and you do fulfill that command that is found here in chapter 15, verse 17, where Jesus commands us that you are to love one another. Now, I said you have the capacity to love supernaturally. Satan duplicates everything God does. You know that? Give me some of the things that he's duplicated. I'm sorry? Angel of light. He comes and disguises himself as an angel of light when he's actually the angel or doom of darkness, right? What else? Think, think about the revelation at the end of time. What's going to happen? A false trinity. The false trinity comprised of? The devil. The devil. The antichrist. The false prophet. It's a false trinity. The Antichrist is a pseudo -case. It's not that he's against Christ. He presents himself as he is the Christ, right? And then the false prophet presents himself as he's a prophet of God, but he's a prophet of the devil. He's a counterfeit. What else is counterfeited there? What else does the devil duplicate? Resurrection. A resurrection, a false resurrection. Remember, this Antichrist will have a fatal head wound and he'll raise from the dead and all the world will be marveled. It's a fake resurrection. It's not a true resurrection. Do you know the one thing the devil cannot duplicate? It's not within his nature. He can't possibly duplicate. Love. Love. 
The devil can only produce what emotion? Hate. Hate. And John is going to go on to tell us here in the final verses of the 15th chapter that the world, because they're children of the devil, all they can do is hate. Hate. And who do they hate more than anyone else? God. God and Jesus Christ. And they hate you because they hate Jesus and God and his word. Make no mistake about that. J.M. and his announcements and Pastor David as he closed the worship set indicated that our nation is desperately in need of God's intervention today. What motivates most people is a hatred. There's a hatred that exists in this nation like never before. And that's the work of the devil, not of God. That's one of the many indicators why I have said that the public ministry of Jesus to the United States is over and the private ministry of Jesus to the body of Christ has begun. And that's wonderful. If you're part of the body of Christ, you know exactly what I'm talking about. How Jesus is ministering to us and assuring us. We have that confidence, right? That foundational support. Remember that word confidence? What is it? The word for the year, confidence. What is it? Hupostasius. Hupostasius. You'll find it in Hebrews twice. But you know Hebrews 11, 1, what does it say? Faith is the hupostasius. Faith is the confidence that we have, the foundation that we stand upon for everything that we believe and hold dear, right? The confidence in Christ and his word. Yeah. And that's what we hold dear, the confidence in his faith and his word. But the world only hates, and the world hates you because it hated him. It hates him because they hate the, his restrictions upon their life. Isn't it terrible? those restrictions he's placed upon your life. Is that terrible, isn't it? Is it? Why is it not? Yeah. It's safe. It's loving. These, these, these conditions that God wants us to live to will only produce the highest and the best for us individually, for our marriages, for our families, for us individually. You know, going contrary to the word and the will of God will always hurt you, always. Make no mistake about it, to different degrees, but it's definitely going to have a negative effect on you and the relationships of your life. Is that not true? Is that not true? So stop it <laughs> and live according to his word. Paul would write to the Corinthian church, the very church that he founded. They were accusing Paul of, of being legalistic and judgmental and, and putting restrictions upon them that they couldn't possibly live with. And he says, neither I nor the law has put restrictions upon you, but your own fleshly desires. Or why you feel that way. Is that true? Sure it is, sure it is. The only reason why you would feel that they're restrictive, it's legalistic, it's judgment, is because... You desire sin. You desire to live contrary to the word, to the law, to the love of God. Is that true? Yeah. So as we break into this last portion of chapter 15, in verse 18, he says, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. This word hate is used throughout this section. In verse 19, he ends, therefore, the world hates you. Look down at verse 23. He who hates me hates my father also. Verse 24 at the end. Uh, but now they have seen and also hated both me and my father. Verse 25. But this happened that the world word may be fulfilled, which was written in the law. They hated me without a cause. So that's what we're going to be talking about. Now, the church, the church should always be manifesting what? What does it say in chapter... Let's see, where do I want to go? Uh, chapter 13, verse 35. What does that say? Let's read that in unison. When you get there. Wait, not yet. When everybody gets there. Chapter 13, verse 35. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. 
with love for one another. Now, contrary to that love that only God can produce in our hearts for one another is hate. And that's what the world and that's what the devil produces in the lives of unbelievers. Nothing but hatred. And this is what he's talking about here. If the world, the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. The world, this word is cosmos here. But John 3.16 says, for God so loved the world. Cosmos. Hmm. But in 1 John, in the 1st Johannan epistle, 1st John, he says, if you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you. How do you process that? How do you explain that? He tells us that he died because of his love for the world, but he says, if you love the world, the Father's love isn't in you. Well, different, different, same word, cosmos, different meaning entirely. When he's talking about the world here in the beginning of this section in verse 18 of chapter 15, he's talking about the world system. The world system, which is controlled by the enemy. Make no mistake about that. He's the prince of the power of the air. He is the God of this world, right? Now, now Jesus tells us we are the ecclesia, comprised of two words, ek, right? Ek means out, kaletos, called, called out. You're called out of where? Out of where? Out of the world, right? The church, the ecclesia, it means church, right? But you're called out. It's a calling out, calling out of the world. Turn with me to Romans chapter 12 for a moment. Keep your, your marker here in John 15, Romans chapter 12. And this is a very important point we're making this morning because this is a very, very, very important subject to the church culture today. I have to say to you, based upon what I understand of Scripture, what I understand of the way of salvation, the results of being a Christian, that what I perceive and what I observe out there is the majority of those who profess faith are not. What's a rhino? So there are a lot of shinos. Christians in name only. How will you know them? By their love. Listen with your eyes. Listen to me. Listen to me closely. Listen with your eyes, not your ears, because there are a lot of deceivers out there, and especially in this our day. There are many antichrists in the last hour, John would write. And we see that taking place today. Many false prophets, many antichrists, and not against Christ, false Christs. One of my relatives, my nephew, asked me what I thought of the series The Chosen. I wish he hadn't asked me. You know... I could tell by the way he was asking the question and the smile on his face, he was really enjoying it. Well, did I burst that bubble? If you're watching that series, The Chosen, you need to be very, very careful. There are several Mormons involved in the production. Eventually, it's going to get to the point to where whatever you believe is fine because God is love and he condemns no one. It's just, and when, since when did Matthew help Jesus with his sermon preparation? Since when does it tell us in the gospel that Jesus was so angst over giving his message? <laughs> silly it all is really isn't it yeah but it's bringing the the bible into our culture and there's such a distortion of the truth you see we need to be careful we need to be very very cautious of the way in which the world will get a hold of us and it happens very incrementally my wife loves watching those old black and whites you know they're so innocent really there will be no bad language. There's no real negative innuendo sexually or evil. You know, I mean, just, you know, black beauty is uh, shocking to her. <laughs> but she said to me the other day, she said, you know, you, you have more freedom than I do in what you watch. And I had to think about that. I'm just two confessions here. And I had to think about that. And I said, you know, my dear, as I've really thought about that, it's not freedom at all. I, I've allowed some permissiveness to creep into my attitude and I need to stop that because the enemy can get a hold of you so subtly, so incrementally, so slowly that you become numb. You become desensitized to what your eyes see and your ears hear and you need to be very, very, very careful and sharing that with my son just the other day. You know, he said, Dad, you know, it's been over a year since Shannon and I have had television. We don't watch TV at all. Well, if you're not watching TV and you're together at night, well, I don't have any grandchildren. 
No, I, I said, well, so what, what do you, he said, well, I, I stay occupied. Shannon and I read a lot, and then we, uh, we just, but we don't miss it at all. Then. So that's fantastic, son. I'm going to try to limit my viewership as much as possible this year. Why? I don't want to be affected by this culture. There are many times along the years where I have been, David can attest to this, where I've shared with you and myself, why don't we pray and ask the Holy Spirit what we find acceptable and he finds detestable about our life. I challenge you to do that. Oh, and you'll, you'll, he'll tell you. You'll feel that Holy Spirit burn. <laughs> and then what are you going to do about it? You see, that's, that's the issue, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I didn't mean to get off on that. But here, we're talking about the world and how it gets a hold of our lives incrementally. Even as Christians, verse 12, Paul writes, he says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. How do you do this? He's telling you, you need to present yourself to God, to yield to God and let God do everything he wants to do in your life. How do you do that? He tells you right in the beginning, by the mercies of God. <laughs> you understand? That's the only way you can do it. Grace, right? Grace that works within to keep me to doing what is right, right? And keep me from doing what is wrong. That's how you do it. It's by the mercies of God. You say, God, help me. Help me to truly surrender my life to you. Help me, Lord, truly, to be everything that you called me to be as your son and your daughter. Give me that grace. Give me that mercy, Lord, to really offer you as a living sacrifice. And it's going to be, it's going to cause a sacrifice, isn't it? Because our flesh, our desires go one way and his will for our life go another. And so there's a sacrifice involved. There's an anguish. There's a death, a death of your desires, a death of your flesh, a death of the lust that would get a hold of you so easily. Yes, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies. Now, why does he say body? Because the way in which the devil gets a hold of us more than any other is through the immorality of life. I only, there's only three sins that I deal with. I've conquered over most every but three. What were they? Lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. That's all I did. <laughs> and most of those have to do with the body and the body appetites, don't they? That's why he's saying, present your bodies. Now, as in the first century, so too today, a lot of people think, well, I'll let the body have its way. I'll just ask God to forgive me and I'll be okay. Nay, nay. The Bible never taught that. Never has, never will. Get that out of your mind and out of your thinking completely. You're presuming upon the grace of God. And they'll say, depart from me for I never knew you. If you're living that way and you have that attitude. Hmm. And in verse 2 of chapter 12 of Romans, and do not be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, Paul understands that we're, we're so tempted by the world that the world can have such a powerful influence upon our life, even as believers. So we have to pray for God's mercy that he would strengthen us. How many times have you heard me say, beloved, I am so thankful for God's saving grace, aren't you? But I am equally, probably maybe even more so thankful for his keeping grace. God has kept me all these 41 years. I haven't kept myself. And as soon as you decide to take credit for that, he'll show you how much you've kept yourself, how strong you are. But in my weakness, his strength is made perfect. Turn to me to 2 Corinthians now. We're, we are called out. We are the ecclesia, called out, called out of the world. Paul talks about this again in 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians is very much, well, the church of Corinth was very much like the church today. What was the church of Corinth known for from a positive aspect? Yes, the gifts of the Spirit. All of the gifts of the Spirit were manifest in this church in Corinth. If you read chapter 13, that's a love chapter. And then you go on into chapter 14 with chapter 12, 13, 14, 15. He, he talks about love being exercised through the gifts of the spirit. But, but, but not only did this church possess so many manifestations of the gift of the spirit, there was such perversion of the flesh. The church at Corinth, if you study the church at Corinth, it's very, very carnal, very fleshly. It's amazing 
the servants that God will use at times to accomplish his will. Hmm? Second Corinthians, you there? Verse 14. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't tell you the chapters. Chapter 6. 2 Corinthians 6. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with for what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with the darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial or the devil? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? Now, very, very, listen, very, very, very important. If you're a young person here, we don't believe in missionary dating. Oh, I'll pray they'll get saved. You know, how many people have, have lived a life of sorrow because they married someone who they knew wasn't an unbeliever, but thinking falsely that they were going to come to faith later on after they were married? Well, after the boy gets the girl, there's very little you're going to be able to motivate him to do. Is that true? Yeah, sure it is. Sure it is. But you're not to be unequally yoked, whether it's marriage or business or any strong relationship. Why? Why? Because that relationship will hurt you more than it will them. They'll affect you. Come here, Anthony. Come over here. Stand right there. No, no, look at me, not them. Look at me. Grab my hand. Grab my hand. Right. Now, now, if I'm the believer and you're the unbeliever, right? I want to pull you up to where I am, but you're trying to pull me down. Who's got the leverage? Who's got the advantage? You. Huh? Who? You. You're down below. You think I'm going to be able to pull you up? Huh? 71 years old, how old are you? 20. It ain't happening, okay? <laughs> I'm not going to be able to pull you up. You're going to pull me down, and what's working on your behalf? Gravity, that's right, gravity, because naturally the flesh wants to go down, right? That's what happens. Unbeliever, believer. There's a huge disadvantage that the believer is in. This is what Paul is writing about. Do you understand this? Very, very important. Now, you're to witness and you're to love the unbeliever, but you can't yoke yourself in a close relationship, business, marriage, otherwise, because it'll affect you negatively. Make no mistake about that. He goes on to say, verse 16, for what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I, do, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, as the ecclesia, what does it mean? Called out. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and the spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So the first thing, the first step is to do what? Come out. Come out of where? Out of the world, out of worldliness. I know a pastor, a friend of mine, who in the beginning of the ministry, he thought, you know, I need to relate to these people. I need to be cool. I need to be hip. So as a hipster, he started hanging around with the wrong crowd, and he started drinking. And one day, as he's sitting around drinking around, uh, drinking with all these people he's trying to witness to, they said to him, you know, you're the coolest pastor. You're the coolest Christian we've ever known. And then it hit him. <sighs> that hot light of the Holy Spirit. He's compromised. And he stopped drinking completely. And he said, I no longer want to be cool. I want to be consecrated. I, I don't want to be hip any longer. I want to be holy. Be ye holy, saith the Lord, as I am holy. A perfection of performance? No, a perfection of relationship. Loving God with all your heart. Choosing to do his will. To follow his commandments, you see. We need to be very, very careful that you're in pursuit of holiness, that you're in pursuit of being consecrated, set apart. That, that word appointed, right, means to be ordained. Don't you want to be ordained of God to be used of him to touch other people's lives? Well, that comes as you willingly surrender and submit to him, precisely what he's talking about here. And then he goes on to perfect that holiness in the fear of God. Well, how do you perfect holiness? I'm sorry? How do you? How would you perfect holiness in your life, John? 
by reading the word of God and by surrendering to the Holy Spirit who is in you. You are the hagios of God. That means most, most holy ones is what it means. The agapetos, hagios, koletos. You're the called beloved saints of God. But why are you holy? Because you are the possession of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit now possesses your life. He is, dwells within you. And he is the one who makes you holy. If you're going to perfect holiness, it's simply that you yield to his work. Now, as a believer, if you ask him to guide you every single day, he will. He'll speak to you. Oh, yeah, go ahead, do that. Oh, no, no, we shouldn't do that. No, that's not who we are anymore. Oh, don't even think that thought. No, no. Is that not true? Do you pray for the Holy Spirit's guidance in your life daily? Over what you should do, what should you see, what should you watch, what you should say? That's how we perfect holiness. But we have to come out. We come out from the world, just as Israel came out of Egypt. Oh, but as they experienced that wilderness wandering and some of the difficulties there, what happened? They wanted to go back to that old way of life. Was there anything back there for them? Is there anything back there for you in that old life? Does the world have anything to offer us in comparison to what God has before us? No, never. And don't let your flesh lie to you. Believing that somehow what your flesh desires is more beneficial, more pleasurable, more good than what God has for you. Nothing could be farther from the truth. Mm. Go back to our text. We're talking about coming out of the world, right? Let's, let's read the text, and then I want to go over to what John has to say in 1 John with regard to the world and the believer. We're talking about the relationship. Chapter 15 is talking about the relationship between the believer and God. That's the first eight verses. Then he's talking about a relationship believer to believer. That's verses 9 through 17. Now we're talking about a relationship to the world, 18 through 25. Chapter, 18, uh, chapter 15, verse 18 of John. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, then the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, ecclesia, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word which I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know him who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would have no sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. He who hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works which no one else did, they would have no sin. But now they have seen and also hated both me and my father. This, but this happened, that the word might be fulfilled, which is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. Mm. The world. And we are warned repeatedly over and over and over again to be careful not to touch the world. Turn with me to 1 John chapter 2. The first Johannine epistle, same writer, bearing the same truth for us. For God so loved the world. Who is the world there in that, in that verse? Who? For God so loved the world, the cosmos, but it's people. God so loved people. Every single human being that ever comes into existence, right, is a child of God, son or daughter of God universally, but spiritually they must be born again, right? So God loved the world. God, God loves every, you'll never, ever, 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 ever meet someone that Jesus didn't die for. Do you understand that? Jesus gave his life for everyone. The only way to experience the effectiveness or the efficaciousness of that death is by receiving him in your heart. But here, John writes in chapter 2, 1 John verse 15. Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now, what is the world here? What's the definition of the world in this verse? Cosmos. Same word, cosmos, but different definition. One was people, this is 
system, the evil, sinful, wretched system that exists today. There, there are no perfect governments on earth, are there? No. The, the purest form of democracy is where? Israel. 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 Our democracy or our federal government has turned into a criminal organization. We're no longer the democracy that, and the republic that we were. Israel is more of the What we are in conscience or what we were in history, Israel is today. But even so, is Israel a perfect country? Perfect government? Perfect people? No, 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 no. There are none. Oh, not until that prince of peace comes to establish his kingdom. And then he will be the benevolent dictator of the world. There's only one rule when he returns, his, right? And if you have a problem with that, then you really don't understand the love that, with which he rules with. Hmm? And that's the problem with people today, why they think his, his word and his, his law may be restrictive. They don't understand the love behind it all. As you're raising your children, they don't understand the love you have for them. They don't understand how you're trying to protect them through the things that you insist them they do or not do. Do not love the world, nor the things therein. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust thereof. But he who does the will of God abides forever. It's a testimony that you are in God. It's a testimony that you have everlasting life. Why? Because you abide in God and you obey his commandments. But without the power of the Holy Spirit, desire will always trump your convictions. Always. Lust will always overcome or overshadow conscience without the power of the Holy Spirit. Do you understand that? You, you have no power over the lusts of the flesh. You have no power over the desires and the sinfulness of your flesh without the person of the Holy Spirit. But he can give you that power. Now, even as believers, we can choose not to tap into that power that's ours. There were plenty of times in my early walk where I did not manifest the relationship I should have that I have with my father. I took his grace, his mercy, and his salvation for granted. I presumed upon my father and his love. I betrayed his love. I'm certain none of you have done that. We all have, haven't we? But over time, over the process of time, as we walk with him more, understand him more, and experience his love more, in turn, we love him more and serve him more and surrender more. And so that heart of mine that would betray him is transformed, it's changed, just as we were speaking. A metamorphosis takes place. That's the word there for transform, right? Like a caterpillar becomes this gorgeous butterfly. This wretched me becomes a godly man. The wretched you becomes a godly man or woman as we truly do surrender to his will and his desires. Look at chapter 3 of 1 John. Chapter 3, verse 1. Behold what manner of love the Father has stowed upon us, that we should be called the children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. We are the technon, the adult adopted children of God. We call him Abba, Father now, through adoption, right? But there should be something very different, distinguishably, uniquely different from us than our unsaved neighbors, that they should be able to see in you. And they won't understand this difference until they once experience it. It's, it's hard to explain to people what takes place, isn't it? When the Holy Spirit comes within your life and transforms you, you know. But this is what Paul, uh, John is talking about here. Beloved, now we are the children of God. It has not yet been revealed what we shall be. This is verse 2 of chapter 3. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. What is this desire? This is his desire is that we become more Christ-like every day. Now, listen to me. You will not stay in an arrested or a suspended state of spiritual development. You understand? No one stays static. You're either going forward or you're going back. You're either becoming Christ-like or you're acting more like that old man or old woman. 
and understand. I, I believe once saved, always and forever saved. You believe that? Yeah. You cannot lose the gift of God. It's a gift. You didn't earn it, and you can't do anything to keep it. God gave it to you. It's a gift. But you can render yourself completely ineffective for God by making bad choices. And you're only one bad choice away from acting like that old man or old woman again. You understand that? Do you understand that? I hope you do. Because that'll keep you from making that choice, that decision, all right? But what we're to be doing is to progress in our relationship with the Lord such that, that he is formed in us. His life is processed, is, is, is moving, working through us more and more every day in every way. Living the Christian life is simply allowing the Christ, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ who is in you to manifest himself. When you decide you want to be fleshly, and you pray instantly, and all of a sudden, that whole attitude changes, and a new you comes forward? Who's that? Jesus showed up, the Holy Spirit. And isn't it joy when that happens? Now, when you, when you ignore the voice of the Holy Spirit, and you start to act fleshly or carnal, how do you feel afterwards? Like a wretch. You even wonder whether you're even a saved man or woman, don't you? Yeah, of course, of course. But this is what Paul or John is talking about here. Verse 2, chapter 3, Beloved, now we are the children of God. It has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Now, he's referring to his coming. Verse 3 says, For everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. What hope? The hope of his return. Now, you do hope in his return, don't you? Yeah. That's our confidence, isn't it? Hupostasius? That foundational support that we have that helps carry us through this life is that we know he's coming and he's coming for us. So we can endure whatever it is that this world throws at us, whatever it is he allows to take place as he gives the world its will. You see, God brought the world to a point of decision. Were you like Christ when he was in the garden faced with the decision to make that ultimate sacrifice or live his own life? He said, nevertheless... Thy will be done, Father. Nevertheless, thy will be done. But you see, individuals, nations, a world, culture can resist God repeatedly to the point to where God eventually says, fine, thy will be done. Frightening. That's what's happening today. That's why there's all of this, this, this craziness, why the whole world seems upside down. Men swimming as a woman and everybody applauding his accomplishments rather than putting him in a psychiatric ward where he belongs. It's insane today and demanding. In the school where one of the children of my relative, they pulled him out of school, the, the questionnaire was, they, they're asked quarterly, what gender do you identify with? I said, if I'll give you a nickel for every gender that's out there, how much would you have? A dime. Thank you. There's only two. <laughs> but it's a rebellion against God's authority, for God created them, male and female. You see? That's all it is. A rebellion. For everyone who has this hope purifies himself just as he is pure. So, in respective of what the world is doing, Noah and his family remained pure in their generations. They prayed to God for the power to resist the temptations of the world. They alone escaped the judgment of the world. How many people were estimated on the planet at that time? Maybe two and a half billion? It wasn't a small population. It was about two and a half billion people on the planet, is estimated. And how many survived? A few, the Bible says. Eight. Eight is a few, if you ever want to know. Biblical number. Few? Eight. <laughs> Why? Why? Because they resisted the direction the majority went with, with their flesh, with their desires, with their lusts. Sin is pleasurable. Make no mistake about that. There's a pleasure in sin. But how long does it last? Momentarily. And then it brings forth death. Obedience, however, brings about a joy that is everlasting. It will not end. Isn't that wonderful? Hmm. Chapter 3, look at verse 10. In this the children of God 
and the children of the devil are manifest. For whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. For this is the message that we heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Not as Cain, who was a, of the wicked one and murdered his brother. For why did he murder him? Because his works were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not marvel, my brethren. If the world hates you, we know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Now, he's not talking about you actually physically murdering someone. He's talking about an attitude that you would have towards anyone else. Jesus said, you've heard it said that you're to love your neighbor and hate your enemies. But I say, what did he say? You are to love your enemies. A supernatural love that we have the capacity to display. Now, listen, if you're going to be in this life any, lo- any length of time whatsoever, people are going to hurt you and you're going to hurt others. Is that not true? Yeah. Absolutely. But what should we do in response to that? Hurt. Forgive. Forgive. Ask for forgiveness. Confess. We're to confess our sins and he is faithful to just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all iniquity. What is that word confession in the Greek? Amalageo. And what does it mean? To agree with God. It means to agree. What are you agreeing upon? My sinfulness. I'm agreeing on what is right and what is wrong, what is sin and what is not. And I'm confessing that to God, that I agree with you, Lord, that I have sinned against you and you alone, Lord. And then he cleanses us. He forgives us. And if we have received the forgiveness of God, how can we not forgive one another? Now, I'm not saying you can be reconciled. There's some people you just can't be reconciled with. Was Jesus reconciled with the world? No. He tried to reconcile the world to himself, but they refused. It was only the church that became reconciled to the Christ. But Christ, did he forgive the world? Yes. 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 Look at uh, chapter 4 of 1 John, speaking of the world, and we are not to be a part of it. Chapter 4, verse 1, 1 John, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Who? You think he's talking about today? Goodness. By this we know the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. But you are of God, little children, and have overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. For they are of the world, therefore they speak as the world, and the world hears them. We are of God, for we, for we, he who knows God hears us. He who is not of God does not hear us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Beloved, Let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The chief characteristic or attribute of our God is love, and what should be chief in our lives is love. A love for God and a love for each other. If you love God, you will keep his commandments. You'll obey him. If you're not obeying God, then you don't love him. It's that simple. Is that not simple? So where you are not obeying God's commandments that you're aware of, that you know of because you've heard now, you're displaying that you're betraying the only perfect love in the world, God's love. Lastly, look at uh, chapter 5. Chapter 5 of 1 John, whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone who loves him is begotten also loves him who is begotten or him. So you love the Father and you love the Son through it all. Verse 2, by this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments, that we know that we are the children of God. How do we know that? We keep his commandments. Why? Because love empowers us to obedience. For this is the love of God, verse 3, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. David said, your your law, it's not not burdensome. Your law is a joy and a delight to my heart. 
Is that true? That God's law, that the commandments of God, that the way in which he wants you to live your life, it becomes a joy and a delight? Sin complicates everything, doesn't it? I, I came to the Lord in 1980. I was 29 at the time, no, 30 years old, like actually. It was in the summer of 1980, so I was 30 at that point, or 29, whatever it was, somewhere around that age, and I had made a mess of things. I made a mess of several relationships. My wife, who uh, was a believer before she met me, decided she was in a rebellious period. She wasn't even missionary dating at the time. She just wanted to ride on the wild side, and we married And for 10 years, I wasn't saved, but she got right with her God, and she went back to church. And she would take my son to church, and they would study the Bible, and they would pray, and I would do my dirty. And life became very complicated, and I didn't see any way out of it all. And that which I willed not to do, I did. That which I willed to do, I couldn't do. I had no power, no power. The two people I loved most in life, I was hurting most. I had no power, no power. And then I surrendered. And once I surrendered, life became so simple and so sweet, sweetly simple. It became easy. I just had to follow the Lord, follow his word. And he began to unravel all of the mess I made. He began to take my life and use it for his good. And my relationship was restored to my wife and to my in-laws, and to my son. And from that point on, it's never changed. It's always gotten better and sweeter and simpler as time goes on. God's way is the sweetest way. God's way is the simplest way. But sin, desire, lust, complicates everything, doesn't it? While I was in New York, I had the opportunity to speak to a young man who left his wife because he came infa- became infatuated with a woman at work. She became infatuated with him and left her husband, and they're just living together. They're not married. And you know what happens at work. You go to work, and everybody presents their best selves, right? Mm. And, and listen to me, beloved. Listen to me. There'll be a number of times, probably a handful of times in your life where someone will come across your path and that person is everything that you desire. They smell right, they look right, they sound right. I mean, and your flesh is just so taken over with it. Now you have a choice. Because love is a choice. It's not a feeling. It's not that infatuation. It's not romance. Love is a choice. And that's when you decide to remain faithful to your vows and you choose to love one. One. That requires the power of God. Look at how many, how many marriages, how many homes, how many children, how many wives, husbands have been affected by the betrayal of love where lust had its way, where desire trumped should not be. Chapter 5, whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves him is begotten who loves him, who is begotten of him. You love God, you love Christ. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments, they are not burdensome, For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Faith in action. Faith that is resting upon that hypostasis, that foundation that upholds us, right? The foundation of Christ and his word. Do you believe it? And you need to believe it not with your head, but with your heart. And it changes everything. He who is, verse 5 now, Who is he who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Go back to our text and we'll finish up. John chapter 15. Chapter 15. Love versus hate. The believer is to love. The unbeliever hates. The believer is all about what he can give. 
The world is all about what they can get. The believer is other-centered, Christ-centered and other-centered. Christ-centric, where the Christ is the center of all things. The unbeliever is anthropocentric. It's all about me. It's all man-centered. It's what I want, I desire, what pleases me. If the world hates you, verse 18, chapter 15, you know that it hated me before it hated you, naturally. The enemy of my enemy is what? My friend. You heard that saying? The enemy of my enemy is my friend? Well, the friend of my enemy is my enemy, right? Yeah. Are we a friend of the enemy of the world? Are you a friend of Jesus? Then the world will hate you. Make no mistake about that. That's what he's saying. If you were of the world, then the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of this world, but I have chosen you out of the world, you're called out, therefore the world hates you. Previously, uh, last week, last week I did a teaching on the wise guys, right? And previous to that, we did a teaching on the Migdalator. But as the wise guys were coming into Jerusalem, right, they encountered who initially? They, they were being too pragmatic, remember? They lost sight of the Shekinah, the Shekinah glory of God. That was a supernatural light. It wasn't Jupiter and Regulus that came together as it did on that evening of his birth. But this was a different light. This was a supernatural light that they were following, lost track of the light, and then they followed their pragmatism. Where'd they end up? Herod's, Herod's palace. <sighs> Couldn't be a more dangerous place for them to be. Is that not true? And what was Herod's attitude towards the Christ? Kill him. Kill him. Now, there are a lot of Herodians today who are trying to kill the message of Christ, trying to kill the Christian, trying to kill the Christian ideology. Is that not true? There was another group of people that the wise men encountered in that encounter. Who were they? The priests and the Pharisees, the teachers. Oh, they weren't opposed but what was their attitude towards Christ, towards the Messiah? Apathetic, indifferent. A lot of religionists, a lot of religious people, they're really apathetic and indifferent towards Christ, truly. Well, ask them if they're ready for Christ's return. Ask them if they're born again. Ask them if they believe in the rapture. You'll see how apathetic and indifferent they really are. I was listening to a PBS special about the crossing of the Reed Sea. And this guy went on to explain how, how it was the Reed Sea that the Israelis crossed and how there was a supernatural event that occurred back in the 1800s that this, this English, uh, Englishman scholar recorded how the wind came in that evening and, and the Reed Sea was gone and it was just a mud area that you could cross over. And I thought to myself, well, then the Egyptian army drowned in four inches of mud. That was a miracle. Again, religionists, right? They intellectually assent to some of these things. They don't believe them at all in their heart. They don't believe they're true. Yes, the Bible is accurate in everything it intends to teach. You can't possibly take it literally. That's what they'll say, but we do. So you have the Herodians. They want to kill Jesus. They're blatantly opposed enemies of the cross and of Christianity. You have the religionists, and it's all in their head or it's in their rituals. It's not in their heart at all. And then there's another group described in the New Testament, the Demas Christians. Remember Demas? Paul writes about him in 2 Timothy and said, Demas has left me for what? The love of this world. So Demas was a Christian only in name only. He was a sparkler, you know, oh, until things got a little difficult. What does Demas mean? Popular. Mr. Popular. Left Paul, left Jesus, left Christianity, left the truth for the love of this world. But then there's the fellow we were talking about in chapter 13 where that room had to be cleansed. He had to go. Who was that? Judas. 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 He was among us, but he was never with us. He went out from us, but he was not one of us, John would write. He betrayed such perfect love, didn't he? And there are a lot of Judas who said, now listen, you, you, are you going to be a Paul? Are you going to be a John? Are you going to be a Peter? I don't think we have any herons here. You would have been screaming by now. Your hair would have gone out. You would have gone out with your hair on fire. 
you have to ask yourself. Uh, religionists, no, I don't think anybody here is a religionist. You may be at First Press or some other church. <laughs> you know. Could you be a Demas? Could you desire the popularity of the world more than you do God? Are you looking to please men more than God? Many, many, many who profess his name. That's the, you can, that's obvious by the decisions they make. They're more in fear of men than they are of God. We should fear God, beloved, not man. I live, I live for the pleasure of one. In the process, I hope to please a number of people, but I want to live for the pleasure of one. Demis Christians, no, they just want to remain popular. And there are many today who, who's that writer that everybody so enjoys, he, he moves you emotionally so, Max, uh, what did we find out recently? He's woke. He's woke. Why? Why? Love of this world. Pleasing men rather than God. Apologize to the LGBTQXYZ crowd. You know. Demas. But what about the Judases? Betraying perfect love. How do you betray perfect love? By simply refusing to obey him. Refusing to abide in him and in his truth, in his word, in his way. Beloved, you need to be very careful. As John wrote previously in chapter 4, this is the last hour, and many antichrists and false prophets have gone out into the world. They will know you are my disciples. How? How? by your love. Love for God first and in loving God will obey him and then love one for another. And even having the supernatural capacity to love my enemies. Wow. Wouldn't that be glorious? Next week we get to the answer. The Holy Spirit in you. You're called out, the ecclesia, right? But you have, as you're called out of the world, there's someone called to help you, the parakletos called to be with you, to be alongside you, then to be in you, and then to come upon you and empower you for ministry. The work and the power of the Holy Spirit, that's what we'll talk about beginning next week. Shall we stand? Pastor David.